Oh. Um, so we are continuing our discussion of rotation. So let me just um, um, sort of uh, uh, skip a few steps um, that we did in the translational motion by simply referring to it. So in translational motion, after spending two weeks on kinematics involving position, velocity, and acceleration, and then you know 2D kinematics, projectile motion, um, how did we relate these motional quantities with the things that cause motion? What was the key relationship that we used? Isha? Yeah, force is mass times acceleration, Newton's second law. We said, or you know, net force is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, oops, I didn't leave room for writing down that this is Newton's second law. This is, uh, this is Newton's second law. And what we are now going to say is that there is a similar relationship for rotation. And we are also going to call this Newton's second law. Um, it, you know, it, it's the same basic law, just applying to, so this is, is the law that applied to translational case. Well, when I write down the rotational version of that, it's still the same law that simply applies to the rotational cases. So, um, so um, <laughs> acceleration I have a counterpart for. So I just say, so something is equal to something times angular acceleration. And what we are spending class time today is introducing and working with these, uh, these two quantities that uh, we are going to talk about. Um, so this would be the quantity that's going to fit in here. It's uh, analogous to, analogous, in analogy with, analogous to force. And the quantity that goes in here will be analogous to, or in analogy with, analogous to mass. I'm using this as my kind of a cheat sheet, because I know I'm trying to get to this relationship. And um, I have one, ex I know acceleration corresponds to angular acceleration, but these two are kind of new. Um, actually, one of them is new. We already talked about it. So something that's analogous to force, something that, so force is what causes motion, that's what uh, causes acceleration. And last week, we were talking about something that causes rotation, torque, right? So we already actually talked about this. So this is going to be net torque, net torque, using the symbol that we introduced last time. So this net torque is what's analogous to force. And um, I want to spend a little bit of time with the exercise involving net uh, torque, or, or more specifically, net torque first. So um, we went through the whole class session last time talking about how torque is related to force, right? Not just in terms of analogy, but in the sense that we wrote down this. As in, if you knew torque, so, uh, oh, I guess I can write it down here, actually. Let me save some space. I'm sorry, I look distracted because I'm looking for eraser. Um, so let me write, uh, uh, keep, keep on using the same table here. So we've been using, um, but you know, I won't expect that you have this memorized. Because <laughs> you just saw it last week. So let's say if we have torque, then what else do we need to know to get the, Wait, let me draw a line here. Um, it's actually going to go the other way. <laughs> I'm not going to get started, get started with knowing the torque. I'm going to start by knowing the force. I'm going to start by knowing force, right? And what we covered the last time is, well, if you know force, then you also need to know the R, the distance. So, um, and there's one more unique thing that you kind of have to know. So if you look at um, this picture here, and let's say, let me get rid of Bob and just have Alice. So if I want to know the torque that I'm, um, torque that I'm exerting on Alice, 
then I actually need to know two things. Um, two things aside from the um, um, aside from the force itself. I need to know how far the distance is that I'm applying force at. So I need to know the um, I need to know the distance r. And the second thing I need to know is what direction I'm applying the force. If I'm applying the force radially, then there will be no torque. Uh, to, for maximum torque, intuitively, I would have to apply in a tangential direction, right? Yes? Yeah. So in other words, what I have to know is as I apply force, let's say, um, so call this R. And as I apply force, let's say I'm applying force this way, then I kind of need to know this angle here. And that's how we described the torque last time. If we know force and we know this R, then the way we would write torque is torque is given by, or um, uh, eventually we are going to treat torque as a, uh, as a vector quantity. But for now, I'm just going to deal with the magnitude. Magnitude of torque is equal to force times the displacement, the distance R, times uh, angle between the force and the displacement. So sine theta. That, that was the expression for torque, right? Yeah. So here's a bit of an exercise that I want us to want you guys to go through, take a little bit of time going through, because this will illustrate something so <coughs> sorry. <coughs> something surprising about net torque. Uh, something unexpected, but it sort of makes sense on the overall sense. So this is on the page three, oh, sorry, page two of your worksheet 11, uh, problem three. So um, it has these figures on the right. And for the purpose of this, um, the geometry is quite simple. Because for all these forces, when you consider the geometry, this is the R vector. R, R. So all the angles are going to be 90 degrees. So sine of theta is all 1. Um, and what I want you to do is I want you to fill out this table. So net force for A, B, C, D, um, direction of acceleration for all of them. Net torque for A, B, C, D. Uh, assume that the, uh, the sphere has radius R. And um, you know it won't hopefully take, won't take you too long to fill this out. Please do that, and I want to point out some um, interesting facts. Oh, and uh, they say find the net force about the center and the torque about the center. And if you happen to finish it early, try the additional question. That's really what I want you to point out. Who's not done with the net torque? Well, let me go through more steps. Um, it, you know, once you get used to calculating it, it's a quick calculation. But until you do, you could. So uh, let me go through it. So um, for the very first one, I'll take a little bit more time. And for the next two, I'll just write down the steps. So for A, well, you look at each of the force. And you figure out, is it causing counterclockwise or clockwise torque about the center? So about the center, this is causing counterclockwise torque. And I'm going to call that positive, because that's what I'm used to. Uh, and this is clockwise torque, and I'm going to call that negative. What about the force of 3F? Is it causing any torque? Not about the center. So all right. So now what I'm going to write down is force times the distance for each one of them. So very first force will be plus FR, right? The plus for the counterclockwise direction, and here the distance is r. The second force, it's uh, at the distance of r over 2. So it'll be plus f r minus 2f oops, min times r over 2. Sorry, what was the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it adds up to 0. 
Um, a lot of them are zeros, but not all of them are zeros. <laughs> Good? So, um, so that's the procedure you are going through. So let me do that for B, C, and D. For B, it's these two forces that's causing torque. So it'll be minus FR, um, oh, plus FR, let's say equal to zero. Um, for the picture C, it's once again these two forces that are causing torque. So minus FR plus FR equal to zero. It's the same thing, isn't it? Um, but it's important that you do it step by step because of the last thing we're going to do. Uh, D, um, so small force F doesn't cause any torque. Uh, big force F, I mean, sorry, this causes counterclockwise torque. This causes counterclockwise again. So it will be FR plus 2FR. So total of 3FR of torque. Good? Yes. All right, um, so you know you might say direction of uh, angular acceleration uh, not relevant for all these that have zero torque. Here it's going to be counterclockwise. Good. The answers make sense. Now you know in terms of filling out table, it, this is not terribly interesting work. But there's a reason I wanted you to have this table because what we are now going to try is the additional question where we are going to shift to the center of rotation. Instead of torque about the center, we are going to find the torque about the bottom of the disk. And I will give you, well, there's really three examples I want you to do. So A and B, that's what's here, you know. Do it, try doing it for A and B. So once again, shift to the center, so that now center is here at the bottom. Do that for A, and do that for B and see what you get. And if you have time, do that also for D. Um, so what I'm going to ask you after you have done A and B is what, what makes the difference? And D will be a way to confirm what your guess was for what makes the difference. Uh, everyone done with all the network calculation? OK, so this is uh, for A. So I'm trying to do them in order from, let's say, top to bottom. So force, F. Uh, let me erase these marks. I can't read anything with those marks. Um, so force, F, times the distance. Here it's a 2R because it's from the bottom to the top. right? Counterclockwise, so it's positive. The second force, 3F, this time it does, it's not producing zero torque. It's producing clockwise torque, so minus. Uh, force, 3F, times the distance R. The last force, um, its direction has changed. About the center, we used to describe it as clockwise. But about the bottom, it's now counterclockwise. So it's, uh, yeah, so it's plus 2F times the distance R over 2. And they somehow mysteriously adds up to 0, which is the same answer we had before. So you, know, you might think, all right, so if it's a zero, is it always zero? And if you're thinking that, that's when you get corrected in B, right? Because when you finish B, this is what you get. Um, minus F2R um, minus 2FR and then zero for the force that's applying right at the bottom. So, well, it's not zero. It's a minus 4 FR. So, all right, that's a bit mysterious. So, why does it, you know, if you had to guess, why is it that net torque in one case somehow doesn't depend on where you put the center? It's a zero in both cases. But net torque in the other case does seem to depend on where you put the center. It's a zero in one, but not zero in the other. Any guesses? Because um, the, the force at the middle is. Yeah, yeah, I'm not looking for specifics. I'm looking for a general rule that can always tell me if I'll get a situation like A, meaning I don't have to worry about where the center is. Network will be somehow in unchanging wherever the center is. Or it's like B, where um, I have to worry about it. Yeah. I, 
Asia war, is that what you're going to say? Okay, yeah. So what Edward and Asia were saying is net force. That's the thing that seems to make a difference. In A, the net force was zero. In B, well, it wasn't zero. So at least that's a good guess. So let me test that with D. Where you, I mean, you can do it with a C also, but D is more interesting. Because in D, you have a non-zero net torque. And if our rule, the general condition is that whenever net force is equal to zero, net torque will be somehow independent of the where the center is, it should be the case. Let's try it. So um, net torque for D is um, so clockwise, uh, counterclockwise of plus F times 2R. And then clockwise, it's a counterclockwise again. So plus F times R. And then the bottom force doesn't produce any torque. So all of this is equal to plus 3FR, which is the same value that we calculated before. And you know, I will give this to you as a general rule. So as a general rule, whenever net, uh, sorry, Whenever net force is equal to zero, what that means is it implies that net torque is independent of the uh, independent of I guess should I say axis? Yeah, independent of axis. So independent of where you calculate the each individual torque from. Somehow they will all combine to be combine to give you the same torque that you got before, same net torque that you got before. Um, it's something useful to know, especially when you are doing static equilibrium questions, because this is one of the conditions that have to hold for static equilibrium, right? So what that means in static equilibrium questions, you can actually pick the center of rotation as it's convenient for you. And in fact, that's what I've been doing in the few static equilibrium problems we have done in class last week and I guess today, not really, but um, I have been picking the center rotation sort of as it fits my fancy. And what this is telling you is that, yeah, you can do that. You don't have to worry about your net torque suddenly changing if you change your center of um, rotation, as long <laughs> as this is true. So that means if you're doing dealing with the dynamics case, that's when it might actually matter where your center of rotation is. And when we come to those problems, I'll point out some general rules for a correct center of rotation, or a center of rotation that will give you a meaningful result. Okay. Question? Why do we use R over 2 for A? Um, because, well, A is the only one where the, where the force is acting is at a distance of R over 2 from one of the centers, and also distance of R over 2 from the other center. In all the other figures, there's no force like that. Just case is specific. Question? Yeah? So for A, why do we use 2R instead? 2R. Um, so, it's because, so this is for where the net torque was about the bottom of the disk. So for this particular calculation, I want you to remember the setup. We were saying, OK, we are not calculating the torque about the center of the disk. We are calculating it about the bottom of the disk. Yeah, and the distance in this case is now 2R. Yeah. So for individual torque calculations, you still have to worry about, you know, um, where is the center. You still have to pay attention to that. But uh, so what this is telling you is that you can pick your center of rotation in a way it's convenient for you if the net force is equal to zero. If it, you know that force is not equal to zero, then usually there will be something that tells you what the center of rotation has to be. You have to go with it. You don't really have a choice. Got questions, comments? 